The opening sequence to episode 36 is a classic case of reframing what we saw in the final moments of the previous one, but the interesting part comes from how it goes about it. Initially, it plants us in the shoes of Amir, but despite her surprise attack on Astoria, the music is neither intense nor cold. Rather, it is almost dreamy and flowing. If I were to titularly overanalyze, I think it subconsciously already plants us in a place of loss, where, much like the flowing river we'd see later in the episode, we feel that a fracture has formed between Story and Amir, and they are drifting apart. But we don't quite know it yet, or truly accept it. More on this in a minute. Though the tone then shifts as Erwin notices them, with even the MPs now straight up calling him a demon for just how unrelenting in his advance he is. <laughs> Much like the season 1 finale and the Annie capturing mission in Stoas, Erwin basically spells out what the rest of this conflict will look like and how meaningless their regiments are, saying, you fought well as MPs, now fight as soldiers, give your life for mankind. For him, there are no scouts, no garrison, nothing. As of right now, it is simply us and the enemy. But of course, much like we talked about last time with Reiner's breaking points, that is but one perspective, so this too is something we'll be returning to time and time again throughout this final chase sequence. As for the title of the episode, Charge, I think this one's pretty simple, because, you know, there's a charge. But if I were to overanalyze, okay, no, 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 it's, it's just a charge. That's it. It's just a charge. Moving into the episode itself, we open up with a follow-up to Mikas' thought process and her regrets regarding Reiner, Bertolt, and more generally, her fight for Eren. Much like we talked about during the whole wall sequence and the first brawl between Aaron and Reiner, her humanity and empathy is what ultimately kept her from killing both Reiner and Bertolt even before they transformed. And so here, she is colder than ever, with her explicitly noting that if Emir tries to stop them, she's not showing any mercy either. At this point, Mikas' thought process is effectively, if you are not Aaron and are a titan shifter, you are the enemy, period. Her take is so spicy, in fact, that even Armin is a little shook by her ruthlessness. But perhaps Mikasa is rubbing off on him, because with him too, we see some very brutal strategies at the tail end of this episode, so just keep that in mind for now. Though one last thing I want to mention right at the top here is just how amusing hearing some of these lines is now that we know the true Emir. Every time I hear Mikasa saying, I will save Eren, and if Emir gets in the way, then so be it, and other lines like that, I'm just doing a double take about which season I'm watching, since, you know, she is still effectively chasing Emir. And all of that is made even more interesting because with Eren activating the Founder for the first time, we very explicitly swap out the fake Emir for the true Emir within Eren, both of whom also just so happen to have important links to Historia as well as the fact that Amir is the first ever character we actually saw within the paths. Again, it's not like there's a link there or anything, but it's just kind of funny seeing all these events that are so drastically recontextualized because of what we know now. Though we then cut on over to Amir, who finally releases Astoria, only for her to spit up like a glass full of Titan saliva, which is just disgusting. I am so sorry if you were eating, but yes, that is what she does, and it is very, very disgusting. Though Amir then calls to her, initially saying Krista, but quickly correcting herself to Astoria. Note that throughout the episode, despite the others of their squad technically knowing her true name, Emir is the only one to explicitly correct herself and always address her by her true name. Firstly, I think it's just a small but very meaningful detail to show that she cares. To her, this isn't just a name, this is her identity and she will respect that. But number two, it of course goes back to the roots of both of their stories how both hid their true selves and how both grew sick of it. So now that Astoria has finally reclaimed her name, for Emir, that hits on a very personal level as well. Astoria then says that they came to rescue her and Eren, but Emir immediately cuts her off because she does not want sympathy or protection. Ever since her arrival on Paradis, she has only ever lived for herself. It was always about self-preservation and, more importantly, independence. She purposely detached herself from everyone and only ever joined the military to use Astoria as another token. That is, until she actually met her, and things got very, very complicated. Much like Reiner, who mere hours before she laughed at, the Emir we see here is self-contradictory. She has put up a mask and tries telling Astoria that they are forcing her to come with them. She comes off as aggressive because, again, she doesn't know how to open up and she's afraid of doing that. 
But suddenly, among that supposed aggression, lines like, there is no future inside of the wall slips out, implying a deep sense of care even when she doesn't know the full picture. She's been told that the future inside of the walls is in some way dangerous, and that is all that matters. That alone is more than enough to fight and to get a story out of there. Though it's here where we get into the real interesting stuff, because as Amir says, listen Astoria, the outside world isn't as bad as you think. We see these two flowers blowing in the wind, and note that there are two of them. Real quick, botanist Kuro has to make a return. Flowers in anime, especially ones that aren't drawn in a super close-up and with excruciating detail, are of course very hard to identify. But that won't stop me from trying, and I'm pretty sure that these are lilies. I mean, of course, big surprise, depending on the culture, they have a dozen different meanings. But a common interpretation is that they represent purity, innocence, and rebirth. All three of which very much apply to our duo here. Pink lilies in particular often symbolize beauty, compassion, love, and admiration in general. Which two very much fit our duo here. Though Amir then says that, out here, no one will tell her that she'd be better off if she wasn't born. Clearly referring to the church for whom Historia's existence was very much a headache. Now we of course know that this is only true to an extent. As both are still Eldians, and even though the church wouldn't have problems with her, they still wouldn't be treated, well, let's say exactly fairly. But again, for Amir, that is currently completely irrelevant. Because there, Historia would have a chance at life, even while bearing her true name. But what's also important is that this is one of those times where we have to take a step back and remember that from Historia's perspective currently, Emir is speaking pure nonsense. From Historia's perspective, there is nothing beyond the walls. So naturally, she just says, well, I mean, of course Titans wouldn't care because they just worry about eating me. To her, Emir is basically saying, let's run away together and somehow live among the Titans? Historia doesn't even have the slightest inkling of anything like Marley. But most importantly, despite all of that, even now when she has no idea what Amir is talking about, she still trusts Amir. Though we then get an interesting line from Amir, with her saying, if you look past the flaws, living among the titans isn't really that bad. I think there are two ways to interpret this. First off, is it maybe that Emir took Astoria's line of, Titans will just eat me, a little too personally, since, well, Emir almost ate her just now. Or alternatively, it's not even that Emir almost ate her, but just that she thinks that living with Emir wouldn't guarantee their safety, implying that they wouldn't be quite strong enough to survive. And because Emir considers herself as completely independent, minus Astoria that is, that might have hit a nerve. But number two, and this one is super intriguing to me, could it be that Emir has an odd sense of familiarity with the Titans? Do remember that she has spent like three times her human life as a pure Titan after all. So perhaps there is not quite Stockholm Syndrome, but just a bizarre sense of they're not really that bad because I've been one of them type vibe. But whatever the case, after all of this, Historia just once again screams that there is no way Emir is being truthful. Then saying she's clearly being threatened to say all of this, only for Bertolt to mumble, it's the opposite. We have long talked about the lack of perspective in Attack on Titan and how that fuels the entire cycle of hatred that we see. But I think this is a very good micro-scale example of exactly what I mean. Emir is currently threatening everyone just to save Astoria. Currently, yes she is going along with Reiner, but she scared Reiner into doing that. And in just a few moments, she would also be scaring the scouts away because, again, she wants to make sure that Historia gets to safety, which in this case is with Reiner. It is, again, a matter of perspective. Emir is protecting the one person she cares about, but she is also attacking literally everyone. On the flip side, though, Bertolt is supposed to be the big evil colossal titan who breached the wall and, again, killed literally hundreds of thousands. But here, he sees the love between Historia and Emir. He himself knows what it feels like to be hated purely for existing. But with these two, he's seeing trust that transcends all betrayal. The supposed devils of Paradis are expressing more humanity than anyone he saw in Marley. I think to him, this hurts real, real bad. And to hammer that home even further, we hear those usual somber strings as Historia just cries out saying, This 
this is the purest form of trust and is one that, to a certain extent, we also see mirrored with Mikasa and Eren in the final season. Just to quickly illustrate what's going on here, Emir suddenly reveals that she is a Titan Shifter, but was then maybe captured, but maybe just retrieved by her allies Reiner and Bertolt. She then baits them into a forest, then attacks Astoria directly, and is now explicitly telling her that all of it was a lie, I am capturing you. Yet still, not for a single second does Astoria doubt her. Is it naive? Sure. Is it her martyrdom? Maybe. But at the heart of it is pure, unadulterated trust. She knows Amir, so no matter what she says, no matter what she even does, she knows that this is not what she wants. And as Amir is very much shaken by Astoria's dedication, Burrito jumps in saying, You can't change your mind now, do you want to trap Krista inside of the walls with you? Here, I think there are two different interpretations. First off, he has very much noticed that the bond between them is way too strong to sever, so what he's doing now is pretty blatant emotional manipulation. And yes, Armin, the brain of our other big trio, would do this at the tail end of this episode as well, so I guess that is a bit of a reverse Uno. Bertolt currently knows that Emir is fighting purely for Astoria, and that is it. So, if he tries to convince her that going with them is not the best for her, but rather Astoria, she might fold. Instead of trying to push directly at Emir, he instead finds her weakness, and her weakness is Historia. But number two, and this one is more Bertolt-centric, I think a part of him thinks that, if push comes to shove, I might need to transform, I might just need to nuke everything here. Judging by the conversation we saw in the previous episode, as well as the stuff we'd see in the flashbacks, he wasn't particularly keen on ever doing that, especially if Reiner wasn't there to push him along. I think that's exactly why the events of Season 3 and the battle in Shiganshina was such a huge deal and almost spelled doom for everyone involved. Bertolt finally begun to act on his own and actually leverage the true godlike power that is the Colossal Titan. We will talk about this plenty more when we actually get to Season 3, but point is, even now, when they are losing, he does not transform. I don't think it's a stretch to say that it's because he saw a story and Amir share this moment of just pure empathy that he doesn't want to just literally nuke them. Again, yes, he is the big bad colossal, but he is also a human being. Also, also, Emir being framed as quite literally between Astoria to our right and Berto to our left also conveys that dilemma very visually. But, as we all know, this is Attack on Titan, so of course, things cannot be happy. As Berto drops that line, we see them run past another ledge, only to see that one of the lilies is now flowing down the river. It's at this very moment where we are already told that this is it. Emir and Astoria are separated forever. Not because they want to, but because Bertolt just convinced her that sacrificing herself is the one and only way to save Astoria. She allows herself to get swept up in those uncertain currents because she believes that this is what's best for Astoria. And man, I absolutely have to bring up the dub here again because they just go straight for the jugular. The sub continues to maintain that air of distance with Emir. Even now, on the brink of tears, she is deliberately trying to put up walls. She still calls her just Astoria. The dub, on the other hand, well... I'm sorry, sweetie. Yeah, I know I'm weird about these things, but just like Aaron's You Were My Hero a few episodes prior, just including that word, sweetie, is brutal. Especially with it focusing on that lone lily flowing down the river. Emir's VAs are kind of 50-50 for me, I don't really have a preference for either one, I think both are excellent, and there is one more scene I will bring up later on that is just excellent in the sub. But like, right here, the sheer emotional damage ever so slightly edges out the dub for me. And speaking of emotional damage, it's here where I'm pretty sure the script just said, you know what, let's hurt our viewers. Emir briefly explains how she stole one of the shifter's powers, and how she supposedly aimed to trade Astoria just to buy herself some leniency. In reality, that was of course her first intention, but when she actually met Historia and got to know her, well, that changed very, very quickly. And now when we get to here, one of the major reasons why they never pursued the scouts back to the wall is because Emir traded herself in for Historia. Is this her just dumping all of her regrets and wishing to come clean to her? Is this her lying to push her away? I don't really think so. I think it's a mixture of those things, sure, but above all, I think this is Amir, much like we saw with her last time, finally accepting the fact that, yes, she is selfish. 
But it's in accepting that selfishness that she can finally show weakness. This scene is just perfect. It is the most desperate plea for help, fueled by genuine primal fear. Again, her entire life on Paradis was one of independence. But then she met Astoria, and suddenly that independence changed, because now she was also fighting for Astoria. And now here, after all the trauma she has gone through, she finally allows herself to be selfish, to ask for help. But it is already too late. We see that Lily flow right into the waterfall, caught up in uncertain currents. It is a beautiful, picturesque scene, but the underlying implication is not a happy one. Those two Lilies we saw, they are separated forever and will never be brought back together. But of course, we still need to set up some emotional damage, so Historia says, Well, like I said, I'm here. As we see the sun shine upon both, Emir is truly wanted, truly accepted. Despite everything, their bond is unshakable. And that is exactly what would eventually turn Emir into the self-sacrificial one. In the most tragic of twists, the roles are entirely reversed. This time, it is Emir that constantly wants to give up her own life for someone else. But as we see her smile and break down, a darker, almost gothic music kicks in as we fade from her to Aaron. <laughs> Remember how I said that some of these things with Amir seem amusing considering what we know now? Yeah, well, this is one of them. Surely I'm not the only one to get a bit stunlocked by this loving declaration from Historia to Amir, who finally feels wanted, only to jump to Eren, who too is being pursued by Mikasa with the same exact goal, and would awaken the true Amir's power in less than an hour. This is definitely me overanalyzing and I am just spitballing ideas, but I do think there's a whole different debate to be had around what might have happened if the true Amir was also ever truly wanted. In both stories, we have royals in Astoria and the king, and titans in the two Amirs. Only difference is, one was a slave up until the very end, the other was truly loved. It does make me wonder whether originally, there might have been even more ideas about potentially peaceful endings to Attack on Titan. Again, I am purely throwing out ideas, but something like the powers fading into obscurity simply because there is no reason to use them. I think there could have also been a whole bunch of stories where we have a sort of a Romeo and Juliet story of both sides, where they sort of get together, the Titan powers are sort of now in between both sides, and you know, nothing can really happen because now they're locked in the middle. But yeah, point is, whenever I hear Amir in Season 2, I do kind of get stunlocked, because like, the other Amir story is kind of, you know, not that wholesome. But speaking of Mikasa going for her boy, that is exactly what we see. We see the scouts now caught up and all begin to circle the Titan trio. Or, I guess with Eren, four? Or, wait, no, is that five with Eren? Well, anyway, this Mikasa ODM gear scene plus the Dark Souls boss music is excellent. Pure ODM goodness aside though, here too we see the same question of perspective. With Mikasa straight up saying, I can only afford to care about so few people. And note how when Mikasa says that what happened six years ago decided who they became, we jump to Bertolt looking out at the world. He is now being framed as the imprisoned one, with the smallest of windows peering up at the sky. And much like Eren back in Shiganshina, he is also faced with a titan threat of his own, that of course being Mikasa. With how much I'm saying it recently, I might as well be a writer for Cobra Kai, but it is again just a matter of perspective. Though we get another mildly amusing line of Mikasa saying, choose Krista, Eren or Amir. Which again, in hindsight, just got a bit of a chuckle out of me. Because, you know, the whole of the final season is kind of like, let's chase Eren, who is actually the founding titan. But is that really Eren, or is that actually Amir influencing him? So, you know, you gotta choose between Eren and Amir. You know, it's kind of goofy. As all the scouts land around Bertolt, though, Isayama once again chose violence. I feel like I need to keep stressing this fact, but they all know for an absolute fact that Bertolt is responsible for the deaths of hundreds of thousands. Though as they actually land, they first simply joke around saying that it would be impossible to calm Aaron down. Not because it's ha ha funny or even because they want to taunt him. No, it's because this is uncomfortable and more so confusing. Yes, he is unambiguously one of the worst things to have ever happened to Paradis. But he is also the person who they slept next to for years. So above all, even now, what they want to know is just why. 
Even now, this morbid humor of, oh, we used to predict the weather by the pose you slept in, is accompanied by sorrowful strings. But this time, it's not just sad or disappointment in the betrayal, because it is also tainted by the horror and truth of the situation. Something that I think is perfectly captured in that slight quiver in Jean's voice as he says, <laughs> Lying beside your victims, yet you slept like a log. I've mentioned this before in passing, but the whole odd bear told sleeping is almost certainly a reference to the hanged man, both in terms of referencing the village they stayed at, as well as the almost exactly same pose that we'd actually see him sleep in. Supposedly, this was a punishment for traitors in Italy at some point, but take that with a grain of salt, as despite there being certain accounts that I think are a little too spicy for YouTube of such punishments, it doesn't really seem that concrete. Even our lord and savior Wikipedia says citation needed, so citation needed. In Norse mythology, however, there are stories of Odin hanging himself from Idrasil for nine days and nine nights to gain knowledge of the other realms, which I suppose you could link to him being the brains of their group. A very passive and inactive brains, but brains nonetheless. Goofy references aside though, we see their entire squad chilling on Reiner's shoulders and quickly displaying all of their personalities in just a few short words pretty clearly working as a reminder of where all of this began. Mikasa keeps repeating to just give up Eren. Sasha says that all of this must just be a misunderstanding, while Connie says that they all promised to go out for drinks together. All of this is still a matter of why. But just as that pressure keeps mounting with each and every one wanting to get their word in, there is a sudden twist in the music, it now turning into this deep hum. <laughs> It is here where Bertolt cracks, with him just blurting out, who would ever choose to kill other people? Who would enjoy doing something like this? Finally, we get a true glimpse at them. Not fragments of memories as we did with Reiner, not implied feelings as we saw with Annie, but an unmistakable, we did not want any of this. At this point, he is almost trying to atone for what he's done. Repeatedly just screaming, why would anyone ever want to do this? I can't even blame you for despising us to the point of wanting to kill us. But in classic Attack on Titan fashion, while this is a huge reveal that, yes, they did not want any of this, it more so brings up about 30 new questions and, more importantly, circles right back to that perplexing, why? Why did they attack the wall in the first place? Why did they do it again? Why did they capture Eren? I think it's this sort of branching mystery that is at the heart of why Attack on Titan was always so incredibly fascinating. Instead of solving any single mystery, the solution actually opens up more doors. A certain ogre would describe it as almost an onion. And so Bertolt's breakdown here, yes it does tell us that they are supposedly victims themselves, but then again, why? We now know who attacked the wall in episode 1, but again, why? We have answers, but the answers mean nothing. But if you allow me to overanalyze a little bit, obviously Aaron being here the entire time is, well, that's the point, they captured him. But the way the scene is framed, with Aaron constantly looking over Bertolt, has a weirdly spooky air to it now that we know how the story shapes out. I think there is a whole different conversation to be had around Aaron and how he's slowly beginning to piece together everything that has happened and perhaps too realizing that he and Burrito are not at all that different. At the end of the day, both of them just want to be free, right? But it's not over just yet, because Bertolt then cries out saying that the time they spent amongst the soldiers gave them peace of mind, with us briefly cutting to Reiner's armor, the mask he wears and the one we've already seen slip. But he then says, It was not a lie, we genuinely thought of you as friends, I have no right to beg for forgiveness, and then dropping the bombshell of, But please, please someone find us. And ho oh boy, is that one heavy line. Made even heavier as we snap between him and Emir, both of whom are going through what is largely the same exact struggle. As for what he means by this, I think the simple interpretation is that this is his way of asking for mercy, for help, and even perhaps some degree of understanding. He tells them, I am lost, we are lost, we don't know what we're doing, we don't want to do any of this, but we have to. So please, find us and save us. Is it contradictory? Yes. Does it make a lot of sense? No. But that is reality, it's not rational, and it's not black and white. He himself said, I know I don't deserve your pity, but he is human, so he will still ask for it. 
He will still do many terrible, terrible things, but it does not change the fact that he too is a victim. Just like Reiner, just like Amir, just like Aaron, and just like everyone else caught in this eternal cycle of us and them. All of them are victims. And yes, I will keep using this meme, because like, seriously, who watches Attack on Titan and thinks to themselves, you know what, I think this side is actually better. How does that happen? But okay, I still have a secondary, far, far less likely and far more overanalyzed interpretation. And that is that this is not a plea for help, but an actual call for help. Technically speaking, founder or no founder, all Eldians are connected through the paths. And all shifters are even more so connected to Emir. So could this be like a desperate plea for literally someone to come to their aid? If we entertain the idea that somehow he manages to tap into the paths, he could technically call upon Zeke or Peek, both of whom he should know are on the island. But okay, let's be honest, that is like a mega stretch. What's less of a stretch is talking in code. You know, perhaps someone like Annie, who he is still unaware has been captured and perhaps is now explicitly asking her to transform. Okay, yeah, no, it's definitely Burrito just realizing the weight of his actions. I don't think there are any path shenanigans or anything. Though even after hearing all of this, Mikasa just casually says, I won't ask again, give up Aaron. To which Burrito says, you'll have to stain your hands with my blood. On the face of it, of course, this just seems like a cool sounding line of like, yeah, you'll have to stain your hands with my blood if you want to get him. But I think it's important to remember that Bertolt does know the weight of that. He knows what it means to take an ally's life. He knows the burden that carries. What he almost certainly does not know, however, is that the person he is talking to already stained her hands. Not with his blood atop the wall, but in a small cabin many, many years ago. So yes, Mikasa being stone cold here, especially after what happened atop the wall, shouldn't be at all surprising. At this point, ally or no ally, she is saving Eren, period. But before Mikasa can pop off, suddenly Han is calls to them, telling them to get off as quick as they can. And we then swirl around to see Erwin literally leading an army of titans right for them. First off, the animation here of Erwin's stone-cold face with that slight aura in his eyes, perfect. Though secondly, him riding atop the white horse, followed by his men, and then literal giants, is the most Tolkien thing I've ever seen, and I love it. Though before we follow up with our God of War commander, we jump on over to the mid cards talking about special titan abilities. Practically speaking, it's nothing new and they don't even elaborate on any of them, but I think it's more so just a reminder that we are still yet to see if Eren has one. In reality, we'd of course see that what he'd reveal in the finale isn't really his titan ability, but rather the founder's power. But point is, I think more than anything, is just a slight wink at people paying close attention and telling you that, basically, wait, there's more. Returning to the episode though, we just see the most glorious clash of titans I think we've seen even to this day, with Reiner just being absolutely swarmed by pure titans pinning him to the ground, with his roars just now echoing the entire valley. This tends to pop up every time pure titans attack titan shifters so very very quickly, with both Aaron eating Grisha and later in season 3 with Rod Rice, we'd see what people look like through a pure titan's eyes. They simply see these small lights inside every single person. The number one goal of pure titans is to return to a human form. Therefore, they have a natural desire to eat what might be a shifter to regain their form. But they have no way of distinguishing a normal human from a human within a titan shifter. As for other pure titans, there is no person inside, so they don't attack each other. That's exactly why we can't just cut out people of their pure titans as we can with shifters. So yes, Reiner being swarmed here is exactly what you'd expect. They are trying to get to Reiner. That aside though, we of course immediately see Emir call out for Astoria and pop off, beginning to claw away at the titans one by one. But when we cut to Jean, we get what is one of my favorite lines in this entire episode. Is this hell? Not yet, but it will be! And man, do I love how this scene is framed, with it deliberately putting us the viewers behind Erwin as well. We too are currently following him in his charge. The music, the white horse again, the salute, it is all just Perfect. Your heart and soul to the cause! Clearly realizing his predicaments, Reiner begins to bash away at the Titans one by one, prompting Mika and Jean to note the opening that has now appeared. But as they are talking, we bizarrely cut to Erwin charging forward. 
And is this not the most beautifully crafted scene to completely disarm us and immediately subvert our expectations? Because what you're initially led to believe is that Mikasa will charge in solo as she always does. But Erwin will be right there to formalize that and we'd soon be zipping all around the armored. But as we cut to Erwin, that is not what we see. The way we just zoom past that tree, only to be subtly met with what is a titan, is absolutely beautiful. And then him just flying and still screaming, go, it's just, I keep saying this, but it is perfect. I should advance, God damn it! Prepare to hear this a lot with all of the Erwin scenes, but the dub just hits so, so much harder for me. I do think this is in large part due to the language barrier, as big surprise, Erwin is supposed to be an inspirational speaker. So when he announces the charge, and I understand what he is saying, it literally gives me goosebumps. With the subtitles though, the voice acting is still absolutely peak, but there is still a fundamental disconnect between me hearing a Japanese voice that I do not understand, and then reading what that epic shout actually meant. I will definitely keep diving deeper into these sub versus dub splits later in the series as well, because things like Eren's Tatakae hit so much harder in the sub exactly because it feels almost mystical and powerful. Anyway, I do think much of this is just me being a weirdo, but if I could craft like my perfect Attack on Titan mixture, I do think I would almost always use the dub Erwin. It's just so, so good. Though what follows is simply a carnage. We see dozens of soldiers just bashed, stomped, eaten, and a number of other creative ways to die. But throughout all of that, we follow Mikasa. And man, is the whole horse to ODM gear scene absolutely breathtaking. As I always say, I am a continuous shot enjoyer, and the transitions we see here are just perfect. Everything from her sort of riding into the lights to her dodging that titan arm, everything just feels so, so fluid. And it's also here where I want to briefly mention some interesting rumors I've seen floating around. I am an anime only, so I'll be honest with you, I am deathly afraid of googling anything with the words Attack on Titan and ending. So I have not dug too far into this myself because I just don't want to be spoiled. But throughout the years, I've repeatedly seen the idea floated around that there was an ending of Attack on Titan that happens right here. Supposedly, it drew on Stephen King's The Mist adaptation, and long story short, was just everyone dying. It was just supposed to be a crushing defeat, and that is it. They tried pursuing the truth, but failed. Plain and simple. The reason why I bring this up is because this whole absolutely unrelenting bloodbath we see as Mikasa rides always stuck out to me as oddly destructive and hopeless. Not like Erwin's final charge, because that still felt like a sacrifice, but this just feels like this is it. Genuinely, if someone made an animation where everyone just dies right here, I think it would work. Once the series concludes fully, I definitely want to dive deeper into this and I welcome you to sleuth around on the interwebs if you're curious yourself. But supposedly, something like that once existed. I think this goes without saying, but obviously I am glad that it didn't end there. But you also can't deny the fact that it would be a very spicy thing to do now, wouldn't it? Attack on Titan has always been bleak, so in a bizarre way, I do think this sort of ending would actually work. But anyway, as Mikasa gets caught, we get what I think is supposed to be another wink at where this all began. With Jean immediately screaming, get your hands off of her, because, you know. Our boy Jean did have a pretty big crush on her, that is why he didn't like Eren in the first place. Though as the scouts begin to get wiped out one by one, Armin lands on Reiner, calling out to just Bertolt. And if I said Isayama chose violence, then this is just that times 15. Remember what I said about Bertolt potentially trying to manipulate Emir earlier in the episode? Yeah, well, Armin does that, but far, far worse. He briefly recalls his conversation with Jean about sacrifices they must make, wondering whether he must sacrifice his life, or perhaps there is something else to give. It's never stated explicitly, but he then remembers Annie. And I think the implied conclusion to that thought is humanity. The thing he must sacrifice is his humanity. And with that, we get what is still one of my favorite sequences of season 2. The scene we get of them sitting atop Reiner is just beautiful. From the dialogue to the way it's portrayed, it's absolutely peak Attack on Titan. Like this shot here, the only way I can describe it is impossible. It's as if time itself has stopped for a moment. The two of them seeming ever so slightly brighter than the rest of the scene, almost singled out in the composition. 
On the surface, it seems like a perfectly normal scene, but just like with the conversation they're about to have, something is just a teeny bit off. But he then goes right for the heart. He says, so you're fine with leaving your teammate behind? They are torturing her deep underground in the Utopia districts. Her body may regenerate, but her screams told us that it does not stop the pain. They are very careful not to let her die. Imagine being in Bertolt's shoes. Armin should not know that Annie is a Titan Shifter. This is how Bertolt finds out that they know. While the actual meaning of what he says is spine-chilling, the sheer fact that he knows immediately plants Bertolt in a place of, this can't be a lie because he is revealing he knows their secrets. What Armin pulls here is so out of left field that Bertolt can't even begin to question whether he is lying or not, because he just hit them with the biggest truth bomb they could have imagined. Again, we go back to how season 2 began. The reason why Bertolt and Reiner were separated was because they tried to keep Annie's mission under wraps, and they did that. And more importantly, it's been, like what, 36 hours since season 2 began? Bertolt does not know that they captured Annie, so for him, this must be true. But Bertolt isn't the only one being tormented right now, because yes, Armin did just give up his humanity. He himself descends to the cruelest level of emotional torture. He tells them that his friend, his crush, is suffering and they left her behind. It is their fault. It is his fault. And I joke about it, but don't forget, our bullhead also has a sort of a crush on Annie and he gave her so, so many chances back in Stoas. But he now must also come off as genuine. So he is now putting himself through that same turmoil of imagining what that image might look like. I know this sounds silly, but seriously, just sit there and try to talk about one of your friends experiencing something like he describes right here. You know it is not true, but even saying it aloud, to me at least, it is horrifying. I don't want to imagine that, let alone trying to convince someone else that this is truly happening right now. Lies or no lies, what Armin pulls here is absolutely cruel. This is something no person should even want to think about, let alone say out loud, let alone lie about. And the way he goes from near instantly recognizing that weakness to exploiting it is exactly why I think many, many people sleep on the sheer extent of Armin's abilities. My dude almost single-handedly beats the Colossal, and I'm not even talking about Season 3. I am talking about this. He absolutely stunlocked Bertolt and immediately made him pay the price as both Erwin and Mikasa appear and yoink Eren. This was as much Mikasa as it was Armin. Speaking of great ODM gear scenes though, we get another one with Astoria saving Amir. The whole horizontal slicing and then stopping on the tree is what really sticks out to me as one of the greats. But again, it is time for even more emotional damage because we see everyone's favorite siblings yoink Astoria telling her to get away from Amir. Though Astoria cries out saying that she needs to go with her, otherwise Burrito and Viner would kill her. But that's when Connie jumps in saying, Emir put her life on the line to save you earlier, she would never use you. The only time she makes an effort is for your safety, even an idiot could figure out that much. Number one, that is just mega wholesome. Number two, it is a very goofy line considering it comes from our supposedly very silly boy Connie. And number three is mega sad because we know what happens next. So as much as Historia does very much realize that her best girl Emir might have actually been pulling a Historia herself, unfortunately, it will not mean much. Because, say it with me now, Attack on Titan is very depressing. What's also quite depressing is the fact that even before Historia can think of anything, a Titan flies overhead because Reiner has just gone completely berserk. The music quickly turns eerie as the realization of, wait, he no longer has anything to lose, sets in. And just as planned, Mikasa and Eren are both knocked off a horse, and in the distance, a lone titan appears. First off, notice the purple flowers again. We've talked about them plenty already, and because this video is already frankly too long, we'll also talk about next time. But it again brings up those same questions of, is it a sign of the Founder? Is it a sign of Eren's face? Is it a sign of Eren being reborn now that he activates the Founder? Is it simply a sign of royalty and great status? Is it a sign of love from Mikasa? Feel free to stew on all of those questions, but again, we will be talking plenty about that next time. But yes, the Lone Titan of course turns out to be none other than Dina Fritz, better known as the Smiling Titan. 
And oh boy, I will never forget hearing that music build and build and build until we realize who this is, only to cut to that continue card. But yes, that is the massive cliffhanger of episode 36, and trust me when I say, I have a feeling that episode 37 will also be massive. Anyway, I've babbled on for long enough already. Like, seriously, I can't speak, and these videos are long, so I've been recording this for like 3 hours, this is insane. But as usual, do let me know all of your takes, theories, and maybe things I've missed in this episode. But I am losing my voice, so I hope to see you back next time as we finish off Season 2 and continue over analyzing Attack on Titan. And that's the video. At this point, I think I'm becoming a paths enjoyer myself where time doesn't matter anymore and I don't even know where I've mentioned things, maybe I've already mentioned them, maybe I'm still yet to mention them in the next video. But the next episode's video is of course also a solo episode one and is literally 45 minutes long and these couple of weeks for the channel in general are just filled with chonkers. If you're following the Walking Dead series, that too will be a 40 plus minute long video, so yeah. And on that note, I want to say a massive thank you to our current patrons and YouTube members who allow me to produce even more of these for you all. For the live Berserk reading series there, I am knee deep into the Conviction arc, and well, I guess you'll see. That said, I want to say thank you very much for watching, I hope you have a great day, and hopefully, I'll see you in the next one. Bye bye